You're going to notice a little bit of an audio and lighting difference in the videos I'm making at the moment because I'm not at my usual workshop. So I'm improvising a sort of mini studio, so to speak. So the subject of this video is cotton candy, or candy floss as we call it in the UK. And here's a couple of cotton candy producing heads, candy floss uh, machine heads. Uh, but I'll show you how the principle of um, candy floss works in the first place. So I'll just put these out of the way. The principle of candy floss is this. You have a spinning drum with very small holes around the edge and a heat source. You pour sugar into the middle and this drum is spinning at very high speed and it throws the sugar against the outside of the drum. But because the large crystals of sugar, shown in exaggerated sizes, can't go through those holes, it just sits in there and gets heated up. But as soon as the sugar reaches about 160 degrees centigrade, or 320 degrees Fahrenheit, it's small enough that it, well, it actually melts and it uh, goes into a liquid, which then forms little beads that just ooze through these holes. And then because it's spinning at high speed, they get thrown off um, at very high speed, trailing a thread of liquid sugar behind them, a sort of melted sugar. And because there's continually airflow through the unit uh, and it cools those threads, it instantly forms basically threads of sugar. And that's all that candy floss is. It is just plain white sugar, usually with a, a food colouring added and sometimes a flavouring too. But you can just pour white sugar into these machines. So um, let's uh, take a look at the way the things are heated. The first one, and this is out of a toy candy floss maker, is the indirect method, um, where the sugar is heated by a heat source underneath. In this case, this spins above some heating elements. And when you pour the sugar in, it's trapped initially in this sort of, it's thrown out centrifugally against this surface here, which then, because it's pointing down the way, presses the sugar, it forces it into contact with this plate. It melts on that surface and then as it gradually works up as a liquid, it's thrown out and travels up to the sides and it can escape the edge of this because it's a very close fit to the dish. So the only way it can escape that is if it's melted and it's liquid form and it, it's reached the proper viscosity that can ooze out the edge over the lip and then it gets thrown out and formed into the candy. The other version is this one. Now, th this one came from a Chinese, a professional candy floss machine, but a Chinese one. And it's very dubious inside. It's just, it's very typical Chinese. It's what you'd find at probably Chinese fairgrounds. Um, and it's not really 100% electrically safe, as most of this stuff is. It's got this big motor underneath. It's got this uh, tag board cobbled circuitry on the side with a big stud triac. Uh, then the motor comes out here, the end, the shaft, and it has a couple of brush holders that go on to, oh, I'll just move this out of the way, and dust off all the crusty sugar. It goes on to these brass um, slip rings. They then take the power up to the end. If I unscrew this, this is the port that you'd put the sugar in, that's a sort of perforated metal strip that uh, stops it coming through until it's liquid. So if I unscrew this, it's very modular, but lots of exposed connections inside. It does have one redeeming feature in that sense, that the, um, the main switch on the side of the unit is double pole, which is a good thing really when you see how this thing's wired. So this comes off and it's got the two brass connectors that go onto these spring terminals. And these spring terminals then go into this flat ribbon uh, heating element. And if I uh, now take the top off this, it reveals a zigzag element inside. Uh, what looks initially like a ceramic uh, insulating ring, and then this metal strip round the outside. Can I get that off? Let's see if I can just prise that off. Oh, there it goes. And this uh, is the strip that is going to stop the crystal sugar getting through, but let the molten sugar through. The heater is basically, it turns out it's a metal housing with, it's just uh, insulated with enamel paint. And you consider this thing's directly referenced to the mains and there's no earth. And uh, it just makes you think, you know, 
the whole head of this could come live, but hey, it's China, what do you expect? So the heating element is just zigzagged up and down, and it's basically, it's a section of heating element uh, that's a flat spiral, you might describe it. Uh, this metal is just a fairly coarse perforation, and then this is just placed in and it springs out against the side under its own force. So the sugar's poured in through this hole, and it gets thrown out into the helm element itself. The, the sugar is physically in the element, uh, which makes it even more odd because professional candy floss makers wishing to bang higher throughput from their machines sometimes moisten the sugar to make it uh, mate better the heat element. It just seems to make it go through faster. Because when you, you're used to making candy floss uh, and you're making money out of making candy floss, you just want to bang candy floss out by the tonne. But uh, yeah, it goes through the, it sits against the heat element, melts, goes through these holes, and then ultimately goes through uh, the fine perforated metal here and gets thrown out. This fan is also spinning and it's basically to create a slight upward flow of air, partly to help set the candy floss to cool the sugar strands and uh, dry it. Uh, but also to actually make sure the, ca the candy floss has a bias towards the top of the machine coming out the top, just a slight one, uh, rather than actually getting sucked down into the mechanism and wrapping around the base. So getting back to the this unit here, um, I doodled a schematic for this. Let's see if I can find my schematic. Here it is. And it turns out it's a very simple dimmer with no suppression, no interference suppression or anything like that, not that great. So you've got the live, it, it goes to the big huge stud um, triac, which is, a, I'll just shift this along. Oop. That's this thing here. And there's, a, I'll just point the components out as I go over this in fact. Sorry for the lighting, it really is just at a window, so to speak. So, I've got, uh, the from the live, it goes straight to the stud triac. That's this red wire here. Notice the green and yellow wire used for live. That's not great, that's earth normally. There's a 240k resistor here. Then the wire goes away across, uh, goes along this wiring loom with the two red wires and it goes to a, just a 100k potentiometer in the front of the panel that can be used to adjust the heater power. Then that discharge, that charges, should I say, on each half cycle, this capacitor here, which is this one, which is unusually big for 100 nano, but they've also used an identical one across the motor as suppression. So I'm guessing that's what, the, you know, that was just the standard capacitor they had. And when the capacitor reaches a high enough voltage in each half cycle, this little diac here conducts um, and that uh, sends, discharges the capacitor suddenly uh, along this grey wire to the gate of the triac. An output of the triac then goes uh, along this blue wire and it goes to the slip rings uh, assembly for the heater. Also, there are two yellow wires, uh, one going, that's visible here uh, and one that's actually tacked to the heater and motor common. and. They're going to a voltmeter in the front of the unit, so as you adjust the potentiometer, the meter is graduated 0 to 150 volts, and it's got a mark at 110 volts. Uh, I have to say, when I plugged this unit in, I've used this unit a wee bit, I got given it as a gift by a friend, the meter just went whack right to the end of the scale, so goodness knows what it was actually uh, running the heater at. Now, the heater is 15 ohms, and uh, if we do the maths there, where's the calculator? Is this calculation even going to show? So, uh, if they're saying 110 volts, uh, just, just these are just rough values um, because um, there are lots of other uh, technicalities that come into play here, but just working on just fixed values of, say, 110 volts, 15 ohm heater, um, the current through the heater will be I equals V, 110 volts, divided by the 15 ohms of the heater, and that will give 7.3 amps, which if we multiply it by the 110 volts, gives us about 806 watts. So theoretically they're expected to be run at 800 or so watts. Now 
I'm not sure what voltage was going out. Theoretically, if you turned the potential to the point it was 240 going through that, then it would be uh, 240 I equals V over R divided by the 15 ohms equals 16 amps times 240 and that would actually be closer to 4 kilowatts if you're running on 240 volts. Now, it's interesting to note that the unit, while I was looking, exploring the wiring inside, had this 10 amp fuse. And it was all, and I noticed as I was pulling the wiring loom out to the trace where these wires went to the voltmeter and the potentiometer, I noticed that some of the wires were stuck to the back of the fuse holder. In fact, it had melted its way through a lot of the wires. And bizarrely, the, the flex incidentally had the colours black, white and green for its uh, main uh, supply. And black in the UK traditionally meant neutral, but I believe it means live in America. But it was switched then on the white, which in America would, I think, be the neutral, and fused in the white. Well, it was switched on live and neutral, but it was fused in the white. And ironically, the, the back of the fuse holder got so hot that it melted through wires, but the one it had touched was the white one that was feeding the fuse, so it basically melted it to the point it bypassed itself. But there you go, the candy floss machines. Uh, they're quite interesting. They certainly uh, They do gas ones as well, uh, which I think are the indirect heated one with basically a little burner underneath, I guess. Uh, I've never actually opened a gas one, but the gas ones are amazing. They just bang the candy floss out quite incredible speed. But um, yeah, so if you're ever wondering just what's inside a candy floss, one of these spinning heads, that's basically it. It's a little metal frame, the heating element, and then the perforated mesh to uh, stop the sugar getting out until it's molten. All very interesting and very tasty too.